Welcome to worship today. We're so thrilled that we are all together in this worship service, especially if you're guests with us. We're so thankful that you're with us. I'm here in downtown Columbus at a very noisy church or corner. You can hear the church bells ringing, calling us into worship today. And I'm here because we remember what was going on at this corner a few weeks ago, the riot that was taking place in response to the killing of George Floyd. We said at the time with that we would again talk about our response to racism in our culture. And today we're going to do that as we think about what is the difference between fault and responsibility as we respond to this social evil. We're so glad you're with us. I hope you fully engage in worship. Let the church bells call you into worship today. I turn you over now to the talented leadership of our worship team. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, you love all people and you desire that all will be saved. We confess that we are often confused by the discrimination and racism that infects our culture. Help us this day to see clearly the evil of racism that is before us and empower us to work to correct that evil and bring good into the lives of others. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning. I invite you to get out your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 12, verses 32 to 48. Luke chapter 12, starting at verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming, and then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. This is the word of our Lord. May God's grace be abundantly clear to us today as we again learn his loving purpose for our lives. I'm here near the corner of Broad and High Street in Columbus for this reason. We remember what was happening here a couple months ago, the turmoil that was going on. On Monday, May 25th of this year, George Floyd died while at the, being held down by Minneapolis police officers, even as he cried, I can't breathe. And you know the turmoil that happened as a result of that. In response, this is what we did at St. Luke. The first two Sundays in June, we decided to change what we had planned to talk about and focus on the issue of racism. The first Sunday, I taught that we should listen more and talk less as we learn what we need to learn about what's behind the unrest. And so the second Sunday in June, we did that when we invited two African-American church leaders, Pastor Tyus Ned and Alvin White into a conversation where Pastor Mike and I mostly listened and learned. We said at the time that we would revisit this issue in the future. Well, today is one of those Sundays when we're going to revisit the issue of racism and what is our response to what is happening. Well, I am in a quite different setting now along this wonderful hiking trail. And I wanted to be here because the illustration I want to use to talk about fault versus responsibility came to me as I was hiking a few weeks ago. Katie and I had the wonderful 
opportunity to spend a week with our children and our spouses and our grandchildren all together down in the Hocking Hills. We spent several of those afternoons and days hiking in the Hocking Hills. And as you know, if you've been there, the, some of those trails are very busy and there are many people on the trails. So one day we got off the beaten path and onto a trail. I don't know if it had a name, but a couple features along the trail it was a place called Airplane Rock. Another was called 21 Horse Cave. They're really cool. But there were hardly any other people on the trail, which was a wonderful experience for us. Well, I'm hiking down this trail in the beautiful part of God's creation, and I look down and I see this along the trail, a plastic bottle. And I look down at that, and I have to tell you, <laughs> some anger rose up inside of me, because that's a really big wrong for me, to carelessly trash up God's creation. And I looked at that for a moment, and then I picked it up, and as I continued walking, I was thinking to myself, whose fault is that, that that's along the trail? It's not my fault. I didn't put it there. I suppose unless we start to think about the general fault we all have for re being so reliant on plastic products in our culture, but that's a pretty big discussion. But I thought, it's not my fault. I didn't put it there some careless, in my mind, sinful person put it there. But what's my responsibility? I hope you're saying, pick it up. Well, it's not my fault that it's there. It's my responsibility to correct that evil. And so I did, and of course, when I'm done using this as an illustration for this sermon, I'll put it in recycling. That's that's an illustration that can apply to a lot of social evils in our culture, including racism. While a social evil might not directly be our fault, it is still our responsibility to work to correct that evil and bring good into the lives of others. There are many passages in the Bible that teach us this responsibility that we could turn to. But we're just going to look at one of them today, a teaching of Jesus. So let's together sit at this wonderful picnic table at the park and talk about how Jesus teaches our responsibility to correct social evils and to bring good into the lives of others. We read this passage from Luke chapter 12 today. I want you to look at the dynamic nature of the first two verses in that passage. Jesus begins by saying this, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. This is all grace. This is all just 100% the love of God in our lives that through no effort of our own, our Father has given us his kingdom and we are among his flock, his family. It's all gift that we've been given. But look at the next verse, the dynamic nature. Verse 33, Jesus says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. We see in these first two verses the dynamic here. We've been given so much by God through Christ. And our responsibility then is to give to the poor, to care for those are, that are in need. We see the word responsibility here. It's a response to what God has given us. And you see in the word responsibility, the word response. It's a response to what God has given us. It's our responsibility. This response, Jesus goes on in verse 33, is to say, is our treasure that we have for us in heaven. A treasure that cannot wear out or cannot fail or cannot be taken away. It's permanent. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And our treasure that we store up is the way that we respond to this gift by caring for others. In verse 35, Jesus begins to use a parable about the second coming of Jesus just so that we are on the same page. We believe, as followers of Jesus, that 
He's going to return one day to fully restore his kingdom in heaven and on earth. And Jesus says we ought to be always ready for him to come back. It could be today. And he uses a parable about a servant or a manager that a master puts in charge and then leaves. The master being Jesus. And that we should always be ready as the servant, as the manager, to be doing what the master wants us to do when he returns. That he'll find us ready so that we can immediately open the door to him. You know, you've been in that situation, I'm sure, where someone unexpectedly shows up at your house, but you're not ready for them, and you're rushing around to try to get ready. We don't want to be that way. We want to be always ready for Jesus to return, to restore his kingdom. And we can immediately op open up the door to him. Jesus says that the wise servant or the wise manager continues to do what the master wants the servant or the manager to do. And therefore is immediately ready to welcome them. In verse 42, Jesus says this, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them food, their food allowance at the proper time? You see this connection Jesus makes to caring for the poor, for feeding the hungry? That that's our response? Verse 43, Jesus says, it will be good for the servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Jesus goes on to describe how bad it will be for those servants who know what the master wants us to do and yet are not doing it. Or even worse, doing the opposite. Abusing others and abusing the privilege and the creation that we have around us. So that we can have a clear understanding of what Jesus is teaching us hear this Jesus wants us to care for the poor and to work to free the oppressed in the racial reckoning that we are talking about today in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd our master Jesus wants us to correct work to correct the racial discrimination that has been the stain on our American experience from the start. In other words, he wants us to say, pick up the trash, correct it, and work to bring good into the lives of others. Look how Jesus concludes his teaching. He says this, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Let that sink in, dear ones. Those of us who have received much, much is expected of us. While a social evil might not directly be our fault, we still have the responsibility to, re to work to correct that evil and bring good into the lives of others. Jesus calls us to use what we have to bring good into the lives of others. And this certainly applies to the racial reckoning that we are going through in our culture because of what happened after the death of George Floyd. What is our response to that? Whether or not we see any of this as our fault or not is not the point. But rather, as followers of Jesus who want to be faithful servants of the Master, is to use what we have, our power, our privilege, our possessions, to work to correct this social evil of racism and discrimination. We are to live more for others than for ourselves. That's always the way of Jesus. And this teaching of Jesus and many other teachings in the Bible call us to do the work of justice, to help to improve the lives of those who have been oppressed and discriminated against. Can we now sit back and relax for a moment in order to try to remove the uh, conflictual politics of this issue? And remember what is the core of this social evil of racism. 
It's simply this, that there's a group of people whose skin happens to be darker than most of ours. And most of them, not all of them, but most of them report that in their lifetimes, they've experienced being discriminated against or negatively profiled simply because of the color of their skin. To reference the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., they've experienced being judged not by the content of their character, but by the color of their skin. That's the current reality that we are walking through in this life. And in the lifetime of some of us who are older, we know that many of the parents and grandparents and maybe before them great-grandparents of our black brothers and sisters experienced brutal oppression in the Jim Crow South, as well as discrimination and great restrictions when many of them migrated to the North. That's why we needed the 15th Amendment, giving black men the right to vote. Why we needed the 19th Amendment that we celebrated this week, the 100th anniversary of giving all women, including black women, the right to vote. But it's also why we needed the 1965 Voting Rights Act, because even though they had the right to vote, many of them were prevented from voting. Why we needed the 1968 Fair Housing Act, ending discriminatory practices in housing, and other legislation that helped to end, or hopes to end, discrimination. And we know that the ancestors of many of our African American fellow citizens, most of them in fact, were brought here in the chains of slavery and forced to work their whole lives without pay and living under horrible conditions. Now we can say a lot of that or none of that's our fault. But we still have a responsibility to work to correct this evil that's still among us. Slavery and the racial oppression that followed the Civil War have been the great stain on our American experience. Those wrongs that have happened and continue to happen, that is the condition that people of color experienced and some continue to experience. To deny this is to intentionally ignore what's right in front of ours. It's like seeing a, a plastic bottle on the path thrown away and, and not seeing it or picking it up. We got to get rid of this trash. And I'm not talking in any way about people, of course, but about this trash of this social evil of racism and discrimination. So deeper than any political party or opinion or agenda, Jesus calls us to love others as he's loved us, to do whatever we can to correct the discrimination that continues to contribute to keeping others down and poor. This is the response that love requires of us because of what we've received. And of course, we need to engage in constructive debate about how best to accomplish this. But we cannot ignore it. We, can, we can't do nothing about it to change it and then claim in some way that we are faithful followers of Jesus. For he calls us to our responsibility. I invite you to remember this from today's sermon. While a social evil might not be directly our fault, we still have the responsibility to work to correct that evil and bring good into the lives of others. So here's the next step to consider from today's sermon. If you believe that the oppression and discrimination that grows out of the long-standing racism in our culture is not your fault and therefore not your responsibility to work to correct, I invite you to spend some time thinking more about that. To ask the Lord what the Lord thinks about that. And consider changing your mind about this and then finding a good work that you can do that will help to correct the discrimination 
and bring good into the lives of those who have less because of the discrimination. To use the illustration again, as you are walking along your path of life and you see some trash that you think, I didn't put that there, it's not my fault. To take the responsibility to pick it up, to correct that evil and bring good into the lives of others. God be with you today and may you know his love is with you. Have no fear, little flock, for the Father has chosen to give you the kingdom. now humble ourselves before the Lord to confess our sins. During our confession, we are invited to enter into spiritual communion with Jesus, which means this. After we have confessed our sins, you will be given time enough to pray to yourself a prayer of spiritual communion with Jesus that will be shown on your screen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The New Testament teaches us this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Trusting that promise of Scripture, I invite you now to silently confess your sins to the Lord. Most merciful God, I confess to you that I am in bondage to sin and cannot free myself. I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what I have done and by what I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbors as myself. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a poor sinful being. Forgive me, renew me, and lead me, so that I may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen.
because we are not able to receive Holy Communion together at this time. You're invited to enter into spiritual communion with Jesus by individually praying this prayer. Now hear this good news. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now join followers of Jesus of all times and places to confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident in God's care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. And we make these prayers all our own when at the end of each petition I say, Lord, in your mercy, we all say together out loud, hear our prayer. And we conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we pray for the turmoil and conflict we are facing in our culture today because of racism. Empower us to work to end the evil of racism and to bring good into the lives of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our friends at International Christian Center for Pastor Tyus Ned and his leadership team and all the congregation, that you would help their ministry to flourish and that you increase our connection and friendship with them, that we may serve together in ministry and in fellowship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our own congregation, that you would guide us through these difficult times, to continue to be a church that leads others to a saving faith in Jesus, that reaches out and welcomes all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for our schools as they begin to open. In these challenging times of new kinds of learning, we pray for students and families. Empower parents as they help their students to learn. Give skill and increased capabilities to teachers, support staff, and administrators. That all together they may be learning more of your creation and therefore drawing closer to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick, in need of restoration and protection, we lift up to you especially Annie and Bill Buss, Jeff Cox, Nancy Doherty, 
Janet Dixon, Gary Garbin, Jeff Jerka, Baptiste Lafare, Joanna Mahoney, Sean Murphy, Dennis Roeder, DJ KB and Corey Sharp, Mindy Sproul, Tom Edwards, and Fiona Wagner, and all the others that we name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We celebrate together with Missy and Matt Sayre at the healthy birth of their daughter, Madison Marie. Continue to help them recover and bless this family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those that have lost loved ones in recent days, that you'd comfort them with the hope of the resurrection. We pray for the family and friends of Jean Wall Rice, Doris Roder, and Ginny McGrath. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. We have a few announcements for today. Uh, the first is to just make sure that you fill out your online connection cards. And make sure you click on that little button connection card and let us know that you tuned in with us this morning. And you can also go online and donate your offering, just as a reminder. Thank you to everyone who participated in last week's food drive for the LSS food pantries. We collected more than 100 items that were donated, so that's incredible. It's not too late to become a care caller. This is an easy way to care for others in our St. Luke community, so make sure to fill out the online form and a member of our staff will be in touch with you. One of the locations that received school kits from Lutheran World Relief is Beirut, Lebanon. The explosion that occurred on August 4th was devastating to the people there who are already dealing with poverty, homelessness, and COVID-19. Unfortunately, the blast destroyed three Lutheran World Relief 40-foot shipping containers, which were stored in the port and held more than 22,000 LWR mission quilts, 100 cartons of school kits, 300 cartons of personal care kits, and 125 cartons of baby care kits that were being prepared for distribution. So now an estimated 24,550 men, women, and children who were already in great need will not receive these essential supplies. So the simple act of donating school supplies this fall will make a difference in the lives of others all around the world in the name of Jesus. So we are nearing our goal each week. An updated uh, list of the remaining items needed can be found in your Friday email newsletter. And together we will provide supplies to 300 kids in places like Beirut. Our next community blood drive will be Wednesday, September 2nd from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. in our fellowship hall. So you have to schedule your time online at redcrossblood.org. There are a number of incentives to donate, including a coupon for a free haircut from Sport Clips and a $5 Amazon gift card for those who qualify. All donations will be screened for COVID-19 antibodies. In this week's Friday email newsletter, we share a number of the safety protocols the Red Cross is taking to give you confidence in making a donation. So now, may the peace of God reign in this place and the love of God forever hold you tight. May the spirit of God flow through your life and the joy of God uphold you day and night. Amen.
Go in peace, work for justice. Thanks be to God. Have a great week, and we'll look forward to being together again next Sunday.